magnetic fields in matter. So uh, in this chapter, what we learned was um, materials are actually uh, composed of nucleus and electrons. And then due to the electron orbiting motion and the electron spin, both of these create magnetic moments, right? Small magnetic moments. And then we define magnetization as a volume average of magnetic dipole moment. And in typical situation, like normal situation, these magnetic dipoles are randomly oriented. So uh, on average, it's zero. The net magnetic field is zero. Sorry, net magnetization is zero. But when uh, there's an uh, external B field applied, then the uh, magnetic dipoles inside the material tends to react to the magnetic field. And it can be parallelly uh, aligned, which is called paramagnetism. And it can be anti parallelly uh, uh, aligned, which is diamagnetism. And then it also shows some nonlinear behaviors, which is called uh, 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 ferromagnetism, right? So uh, we uh, discuss that uh, the magnetization from the magnetization field, we can obtain surface bound current density and surface, I'm sorry, a uh, volume bound current density by taking uh, either curl of it or, or taking the cross product of AN, right? And, um, and then like just as we did in electrostatics, we can write the total current as a function of free current and bound current. And then total current is associated with B field, free current associated with H field, bound current associated with magnetization field. Right, but the way it's defined is a little bit different. The signs are different, and also the way the magnetic susceptibility is defined is also a little bit different because uh, susceptibility is connecting H and M, not B and M. Right. So the way because the way it's defined is a little bit different. If we actually write it, write the equation, it's it's a bit confusing, right? Because D is epsilon E. So if you follow the same rule, it's, it seems like it has to be H is mu B, but it's, it's the other way around, right? And that is just because it's defined in this way. Okay, it's just a convention. And then we talked more about like these magnetisms, like different types of magnetisms, like diamagnetism, paramagnetism, ferromagnetism. And dia is just a, a diamagnetism occurs for the materials with no unpaired electrons, right? You know that each state, each uh, uh, orbiting states, you have, uh, you can uh, uh, insert two electrons, spin up and spin down. You probably learn about this in your uh, general chemistry class. And if there's no unpaired electrons in, term, in terms of electron spin, uh, it's, uh, this material tends to be a diamagnetism. And if you have unpaired electron spin, then uh, it, this tends to have paramagnetism. And then uh, ferromagnetism is a fairly different kind. So as I said, it shows a nonlinear behavior. So as, it, as you look at, look at here, um, once you increase the external field, H field, then B also increases. But the strange thing is that even when you, uh, uh, you know, uh, weaken the applied uh, magnetic field, uh, even at zero uh, applied magnetic field, field B field is still alive. And, and that means you have a magnetization and your material became a magnet, permanent magnet. It produces magnetic field even without applied, elect of applied magnetic field, right? And that's uh, and then if you go keep going down, it, it it follows this path, and then you uh starts to go up. It doesn't follow the original path. It follows uh, uh another path like this, okay. And then this type of a behavior, which um, is kind of remember where it was, is uh called 
uh, hysteresis, okay? And then hysteresis can be used for um, creating information storage, as I said, memory devices. And so uh, all sorts of uh, hysteresis can be used for memory devices. But here, uh, ferromagnetism is actually uh, one of the early things that has been, um, that has been utilized and, uh, in, in hard disk drives, like here, right? And then nowadays, uh, uh, the usage of hard disk drive is going down and then people try to use uh, a, a new one new uh, uh, storage system, which is called uh, solid state, solid state device. And this solid state device SSD uh, is actually using a uh, capacitor actually. So long story short, there should be more details, but uh, what, what's uh, happening is that it uses like a parallel, sort of a parallel plate capacitor, okay? So if you have a parallel plate capacitor, uh, it's capacitance, Capacitance is determined by uh, determined by the material inside the gap, right? And then uh, the interesting thing is that if you apply a voltage, a large amount of voltage, then uh, actually some charges are trapped inside the uh, insulating material, and so. Uh, like the same thing as if you increase the uh, voltage applied between these two and then try to measure, um, you know, the current uh, or uh, like uh, whatever thing that you want to measure or, or charge storage, it also shows some hysteresis, right? Because uh, the dielectric material inside can trap charges temporarily. And then in order to move these trapped charges, you can apply the, uh, potentially in an opposite direction. It's very similar to what's happening in the uh, magnetic device. And this uh, phenomena is utilized for uh, SSD, store uh, information in solid state device. And because it's, it's way easier to create uh, uh, capacitors and then using a dielectric material to store uh, information, uh, SSD actually has much higher density in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, information storage. Okay, and um, now uh, we have only three slides. So we revisit Ampere's law. Ampere's law we know that uh, curl B is J, right? Curl B is J, J is the uh, current density. And then here, of course, uh, mu zero J, when we, when we put mu zero here, then J must be uh, the total current, right? And then uh, this is the integral form. So just like in electrostatics, like a, a relation between E and D, we can do the same thing. Instead of using B, we can use H and then change the, uh, uh, the curl of H is equal to JF. F is the free current, right? So what's the difference between these two? Well, they are both correct, okay, equally correct. But the later form is actually, uh, uh, is more convenient because what we can control is free current or external current. We cannot control like materials uh, response to the free current, right? So uh, this equation uh, in, in many cases more useful uh, than this, but, but you can use this equation too uh, with a uh, uh, free current density. If we just replace uh, mu zero to mu, right? This, 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 uh, then then the, these two equations becomes the same. Okay, so, uh, and then this leads us to the uh, boundary conditions. So we are gonna talk about uh, at the boundary between two materials, having mu, uh, different mu's, different uh, permeabilities, how the uh, magnetic fields uh, behave. And then in order to know that, uh, we use the two known equations. The first one is 
divergence of B is zero. This is what we know, right? Which means there's no magnetic monopole. And then we also know that curl of H is JF. Curl of H is JF is Ampere's law. So from these two law, and then uh, by drawing a proper like a uh, 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 loop or a, a proper uh, volume, we can actually derive these two properties. So the first one is that uh, from curl of B, I'm sorry, uh, uh, divergence of B is zero. We know that the normal component of the B field is continuous. Okay. B field normal component is continuous. Always true. This is always true. Okay. And then from curl of H is equal to J, like in this case, like, like assuming that you have a surface current uh, here, then of course by uh, Ampere's law, you expect uh, your magnetic field here and magnetic field there should be different, right? And then how much different? Uh, that's differ by the amount of the surface current. So uh, H1 minus H2, I mean, H1 and 2, like a surface uh, tangential component of H1 and H2 can be discontinuous by the amount of surface current, surface free current. So if you recall uh, the equations for uh, electric field, Electric field, if you remember, uh, surface tangential electric field is continuous. And then surface normal D field can be discontinuous by what? By uh, the amount of free surface charges, right? And the similar thing applies here. Although the details are different, uh, like we can, we, we, we did basically the same thing, okay? And then from the same uh, uh, relations, uh, we got like B1N is equal to B2N, which, uh, which is the continuity relation. And then H1 and H2 can be different by KF. And why? Of course, it's, it's obvious from the equations, like a, in electrostatics, uh, divergence of D was rho Fs, right? It was non-zero. So this is the biggest difference between B field and D field. And here, uh, curl of E was zero, right? In electrostatics. So, and, and in this case, it's non-zero. So that creates this difference. So um, any questions so far? Well, you can, you can type in question if you uh, have any uh, when, you know, after when we are doing uh, the exercise in the, in the next slide. So now we know the boundary conditions. We want to do an exercise, of course, right? And then that exercise is the last slide of this uh, lecture note. So let's go to the exercise. It's very similar to what you've already solved, but the difference is that now the uh, external B field, I mean, the, the, the B field in the outside is no longer normal to the surface. You have angle theta, uh, and then uh, there's some parallel component and there's some uh, uh, normal component. So in this case, try to find B and H inside the slab and then uh, magnetization inside the slab. Just try to do it. I I'll give you uh, a few minutes.
Okay, so uh, I guess it was not too, I hope it was not too complicated, right? It's just uh, uh, applying the boundary conditions that you learned just a minute ago, right? And how you do it, uh, you can do it by applying boundary conditions for each component, right? So let's do this together. Uh, again, like Bx component is the normal component, like a B field normal to the surface. And then B field normal to the surface must be continuous, right? From the boundary conditions. So even the, in, uh, so B field normal to the surface was B0 sine theta. And then this is same uh, inside the material, right? And then this naturally gives you H X is just, uh, 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 you know, Bx divided by mu. So this is the H field, X component of the H, H field. And similarly, the Y component, Y component is surface normal component. And because there's no externally applied current, surface normal component, I'm sorry, surface uh, tangential component of H must be continuous, right? So in this case, HY should be preserved. So HY outside the material was B0 cosine theta divided by mu naught. And then this is equal to HY inside. And in this case, BY can be obtained by multiplying mu to HY, which is mu, uh, you know, uh, mu B cosine theta, mu R B cosine theta. So in summary, uh, B field must be B0 sine theta AX, which is same as the outside. And then the Y component has mu R in front, right? So what that means is the angle uh, of this vector has been changed as the, uh, uh, as you go into the material, to, to the inside of the material, right? Because X component stays the same while Y component uh, 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 gets well, either smaller or larger, right? And then H field is just a B divided by mu. So that's how you get B and H. And then once you get B and H, then the, the next steps are just straightforward. You can just uh, obtain M uh, from the de definition, like uh, one over mu B minus H. And then because you know mu and H, both of these, and uh, so you can obtain this. And then once you know M, then again, it is also uh, obvious to obtain uh, the surface bound current and volume bound current. And volume bound current must be zero because if you take a curl of M, it's zero. There's nothing uh, position dependent inside. So, so the uh, uh, surface, uh, uh, sorry, um, volume bound current is zero. And a surface bound current is M cross A N. And because M uh, has, you know, uh, M has uh, the component that is normal to the surface, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that is parallel to the surface, M cross A N is not zero. So you have a uh, some finite value. So all these things can be obtained just by applying uh, uh, definitions, right? And here uh, you uh, apply the boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions are very important because not only in uh, the magnetostatics, but also uh, in electrodynamics and, all, uh, and, and the wave equations. So, and, and this boundary conditions becomes um, uh, extremely important when you want to know how light behaves at the interface between two material. So as I said earlier, if you have a material, two material, material one and material two, and then you can think about the situation where you have a light coming in uh, with uh, electromagnetic field oscillating. So light is actually oscillating electromagnetic field. We will learn about this. So, so you have an oscillating electric field and oscillating magnetic field. And then what we know is that once the light impinges on the surface, then the direction of light propagation is changed. 
right? We know this. We know that the light uh, is get deflected at the surface. And, and some portion, of course, is reflected, right? And you, you can exactly calculate this behavior by applying the boundary conditions at the interface, right? You can imagine light has electric field and magnetic field. And we know the boundary conditions for both electric field and magnetic field. So all we need to do is you have an incident wave and then we know how the reflected wave and transmitted waves should look like. And then you can just match the boundary condition, right? To, to determine how much is gonna be transmitted, how much is gonna be reflected, right? So uh, we will revisit this boundary condition again uh, at the very end of this lecture when we deal with this situation. But anyway, uh, the boundary conditions uh, in electromagnetism is very important. That's what I want to say. Okay, so do we have any question?